Michael Bisping. This guy has no fear. He never turned down a fight. How on earth did this guy fight with one blind eye? This man put everything on the line for his family. But how did he do it? How did he pass those medical tests? Michael Bisping is a decorated MMA fighter and UFC champion. This guy is insane. Michael, Michael Bisping. Bisping. Michael, Bisping. Michael Bisping. You have to know, you who, have this to know who this guy is. Here is the fateful high kick that left him with a retinal detachment and could have derailed or ended his career. But instead, it fueled him forward. When you have a retinal detachment and this retina falls forward, that area of your vision is missing. This is an injury that requires emergency treatment. I have not personally treated or evaluated Michael Bisping. What I discuss in this video are speculations based on descriptions provided by Michael Bisping in articles, interviews, and the documentary Bisping. Diagnoses and treatments described should not be accepted as facts. It seems like what happened was he didn't have the symptoms of a retinal detachment until about two weeks later. He said that things started closing in like a curtain and suddenly he only had the central part of the vision in his right eye remaining. Well, if it was two weeks between the impact and then, Maybe this was happening slowly, but he just wasn't able to notice the symptoms yet. What I'm wondering is, do these athletes go to see eye care professionals after they have these fights? They're getting so many impacts to the head and the likelihood of getting a retinal detachment in one of these fights is very high. There are a lot of different ways to do the surgery. He said that he had oil put into the eye and laser done and a silicone sponge. The oil is used to keep the eye full. During a retinal detachment procedure, the vitreous, which is the gel that fills the majority of the eyeball and helps it to keep its shape, is removed. So this vitreous is taken out, but you can't have the eye collapse. So an oil is put into the eye as a tamponade, and this helps it to keep its shape. A laser is used kind of like welding in for the eye. <laughs> so the laser tacks down the areas of the retina that have detached and attaches them back to the layers behind it. This will definitely leave scarring. Usually these scars go unnoticed unless it's a really severe detachment. And then he also had a silicone sponge. So this silicone sponge is on the outside of the eye opposite of the location of the tear. It's basically bringing the rest of the eye closer to where the retina is starting to pull off so that it stays attached better to the blood supply underneath. When this blood supply is lost, vision is lost. Based on the amount that he has described the curtain closing on his vision, I would expect him to have some reduced peripheral vision in that eye. Um, but having the central vision remain. Unfortunately, after Michael Bisping had his retinal detachment repair surgery, he had some complications. Sounds like a few weeks after this surgery, he said that he had a severe headache and he tried to push through it and go on a run. Later on, he did come to the conclusion that you know, something bad was going on with his eye. He went to his doctor and his eye pressure was 90. A normal eye pressure usually is between 11 and 21. 90 is obviously way higher than 21, and that means glaucoma. There are different types of glaucoma. In this particular case, it's angle closure glaucoma. This is a possible complication of retinal detachment surgery. We could pretend this keychain is an optic nerve. It comes out of the back of the eye and goes to the brain. So. From the inside, if this optic nerve is being pushed on by such high pressure, it's not getting blood flow and it will kill the nerve. And he said that they uh, shot a laser to let the fluid through. In a laser iridotomy, what they do is they shoot the iris with a laser to poke a little hole through there. So this little hole will allow the fluid to flow through and escape and cause the eye pressure to go down. And unfortunately, in his case, this laser iridotomy wasn't enough because he continued to have this problem. And he said he ended up going back to another doctor 
who stuck a huge needle in his eye. What I think happened was an anterior chamber paracentesis. Uh, what they would do is take a needle to pierce the edge of the cornea to allow the fluid to exit. That wasn't even enough to lower the pressure and that he went into another emergency surgery where they were implanting a plastic device to allow the pressure to leave. What I think he had here was a tube shunt. What they do is they insert a little plastic tube. It's going to be between the cornea, the clear part, and the iris, the colored part. And this tiny little tube from up above will allow the fluid to flow out. And there's this little area on top of the eye that's usually mostly hidden underneath the person's eyelid uh, that the fluid will collect and drain through other routes. He said that the anesthesia wore off during this surgery and that the pain was horrible. I mean, can you imagine? He said that they had to put him back under, remove that tube, and redo the surgery all over again. Uh, this eye has been through so much already. With the amount of time that he had this high of a pressure, I would expect him to have significantly reduced peripheral vision, maybe even affecting his central vision at this point. Unfortunately, this isn't the end of his eye complications. So at this point in Michael Bisping's career, I'm thinking he has very minimal vision in the right eye, but how did he continue to compete? Well, he got past commissions, he got past tests, doctors somehow, and he was still able to compete with that eye, which is really remarkable. To compete in the UFC, you have to have vision of 2200 or better, but there's no way that he was seeing that well out of that eye. And he says himself that he lied and cheated. Did he memorize the charts? You know, most people know that the top of the chart is an E, but nowadays most charts are electronic and can be changed with the push of a button. I don't want to say anything further because I definitely don't want to get into trouble. I'm glad that it didn't turn out negatively for him in the long run. Um, and that he didn't have severe enough damage to the left eye to cause him to go blind, but he definitely put himself at risk for that, and that's why these rules are in place. We know that he has very little vision in that right eye, yet he continues fighting. But what does that mean for his depth perception? He wouldn't have any. If he doesn't have any vision in the other eye, there is no depth perception. He's at serious risk, and he definitely has a major disadvantage compared to his other competitors. As far as my opinion goes, whether he should have continued fighting or not after this right eye injury, that is a hard no. Usually people that only have one functioning eye are recommended to wear polycarbonate glasses, even people that don't need a glasses prescription. The reason for this is that polycarbonate is a material that's the most shatter resistant, so having that in your glasses helps to protect you from any freak accidents that might come your way. Like, and if that's your only good seeing eye, then that would mean blindness. So the fact that he went into the octagon and that his job was literally to be actively punched in the face is totally insane to me. We even right, saw that he was busy. punched above the left eye and blood was pouring and pouring into his face and he could barely see because it was blocking his vision and he only had that good eye. So that put him at serious risk for further injuries. Then a few years later against Dan Henderson, he had an orbital fracture. The orbit is made up of a number of very small thin bones that fracture quite easily upon impact. Blindness in the case of an orbital fracture is rare but the most common complication is entrapment of the inferior rectus muscle in the fracture, and this can affect the eye's ability to move. The biggest issue this tends to cause is double vision. Of course, in Michael Bisping's case, he cannot have double vision. Finally, in his fight against Kelvin Gastelum, Michael Bisping got an injury that totally changed his mindset and ended his career in his own mind, and he finally decided to retire. And that injury was a posterior vitreous detachment, or PVD. The vitreous gel is tightly attached along the retina in a few places. The optic nerve, which connects the eye to the brain, the macula, which is responsible for central vision, the blood vessels, and around the way edge of the retina, which is where most retinal holes or tears occur. People who experience PVDs tend to have flashing lights or brand new floaters very similar symptoms as a retinal detachment. So as these occur, it's very important to get checked out right away. What happened to him was he was hit, 
he started seeing a bunch of floaters and he thought, oh my gosh, this is it. I have a retinal detachment, I'm going blind. But he saw his doctor and it was just a posterior vitreous detachment. After you have a posterior vitreous detachment, it's still possible that a retinal detachment can develop. So that's something that needs to be watched quickly. Once you get past a certain period of time, the risk kind of decreases, but he'll need to keep an eye on that pretty regularly. Nothing needs to be done for a posterior vitreous detachment. It is what it is once it happens. These floaters tend to become a little bit less noticeable over time, although sometimes there are larger ones that can stay in the way. Posterior vitreous detachments are actually a normal occurrence with age, but for him, having only one good eye and being younger and happening because of trauma, that's definitely an eye-opener. And I'm glad it was for him because he decided at that moment to retire, which I think was a good move. All that still doesn't really answer why his eye is shrunken and kind of whitish, scarred looking, and why he wears a prosthetic. Well, he has developed what is called thysis bulbi, which is basically an end stage eye. The eye begins to shrink down because the structures are disorganized. This can happen for a number of reasons, including inflammation, infection, surgery, and trauma, and we know he has at least two of those. Basically, an eye with thysis is a almost non-seeing eye. A visual acuity that I would expect from an eye like this would be, I would guess, somewhere around uh, light perception, uh, but definitely not an eye that's going to give him any sort of functional vision, unfortunately. He wears what's called a shell prosthesis, which fits over that non-functioning eye, and his prosthesis, that is top-notch. If I didn't know this happened to him and he was looking in a certain direction, I would have no idea that he went through any of this at all. It's just a really well done eye. People who make these are called ocularists and they're not just trained with fitting these properly to each individual, but they're very skilled artists as well. And whoever made that was amazing. It's really hard to tell that he's even wearing it at all. It's truly amazing. Those prosthetic eyes are thousands of dollars and it seems like he probably paid quite a bit for that one. Let me know if you like videos like this. There are so many eye injuries out there in sports that we have plenty to cover. So if you wanna hear more about what might've happened to a certain athlete, comment below, let me know their name and I'll try to fill in the blanks if I can. Subscribe so you don't miss any further videos and thanks for watching. And thank you to Michael Bisping for giving us a very interesting and complex eye case to talk about. As sad as that may be that people have these injuries, at least we can learn something. So we'll look at it that way. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.